So, we have the fun distinction of being next door to Spence. So we need to make sure that they know that we're over here. So when you see something you can get, you can, that you like or a question, we can laugh. We hear them make any noise, we have to laugh at them. Okay, these are just IT pros. They're going to get excited about clicking buttons. We're going to actually build some stuff. All right, how's everybody doing? You enjoying the show so far? Yeah, good show? This is the best conference, the best SharePoint conference in the world by far. This blows everybody else out of the water. So it's uh, very cool to be here again, very, very flattering to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is about workflow and the new world of workflow that we have in SharePoint 2013 with some of the new tools that we have. So my name is Andrew Connell. I'm an MVP for SharePoint Server. I've got a SharePoint focused blog. Um, on my emails up there as well. You can also see I'm on Twitter. Um, I do a bunch of, uh, I do training, mostly a lot of training, a lot of articles, a lot of content, um, both teaching hands-on classes for a company called Critical Bath Training, and then I do a lot of um, online and on-demand training for Pluralsight. So actually working on two classes right now for Pluralsight on workflow fundamentals and advanced topics, um, two different courses that should be up in, uh, uh, in the next two months or so. Um, I want to put this link up here, give you guys a chance to write this down if you want. Everything that I'm going to show you, um, with the exception of one little ad hoc demo that I'm going to do at the beginning, all of the stuff, all the demos are up there. They can, you can download them right now. The slides are up there as well. Um, that is a case-sensitive URL. It's just basically a redirect to a bit.ly URL. That's a redirect to a short URL. That's a redirect to a SkyDrive public URL. <laughs> so I decided, look, we're developers. How much exercise do you guys get? So we're going to hop around a little bit. Let the browser do some work for us. Anyway, so SP Evo 13, oop, there goes my mic. SP Evo 13 dash and then the session code. All right? And again, it's all, um, it's all case sensitive. Um, also, feel free to, if you've got a question during the session, I'll, I might try and do one or two questions during the session, but I want to make sure that I have enough time to get through all the stuff that I want to show you, so I might punt some to the very end. Um, if you don't want to wait around to ask your question too, go ahead and post it to Twitter. Um, when the internet is up, I will um, definitely jump over and go answer those questions as much as I can, um, as long as they're tagged to where I can see them, which is just dev204 is all you really have to do is put that in your, your hashtag. All right, so what are we going to talk about? Um, I'm going to spend just a few minutes really, er, really quick and just kind of give you the state of where we are as far as workflow goes. Um, I have never been a huge fan of building workflows in previous versions of SharePoint because I always found that it was pretty tricky and hard to actually uh, get things working and debug and all that stuff and it seemed like there were always like little issues in the workflow engine. Um, I love what they have done in this, new, in this new version and I say this and it's going to sound like I'm poking fun at them, um, but I honest to God, it, the SharePoint and workflow, the workflow piece, the workflow story in SharePoint is so much better because now SharePoint's not in the picture anymore. They've outsourced workflow to the workflow and Azure team, um, and will be and SharePoint workflow now works so much better now that SharePoint isn't involved. Right? It's kind of the same thing that happened with web parts. SharePoint came up with web parts and going to our keynote theme of looking backward and looking all the evolution. SharePoint invented the whole web part framework back in the 2003 time frame and had a precursor in 2001. And then Scott Guthrie's team saw that and said, hey, we like it. And took the web parts and put it into ASP.NET. And then the SharePoint team said, hey, we're out of the web part framework. And everybody's like, hey, this stuff works great. <laughs> Same thing is true with workflow. So I'm going to do workflow in SharePoint 2013, talk about some recent updates that are really important as far as workflow goes. Um, and then I'm gonna, we're going to look at a bunch of the different improvements. So how to do custom tasks and how to do custom task outcomes. I'll show you a bug that's, in the, uh, that's actually in the current stuff and then how to get around it. Working with web services, that one we hope is going to work because I don't know, has anybody noticed that it might be kind of tough to check email today with the internet kind of going up and down? Calling a web service is a little tough when the internet's going up and down. So I may have to do jazz hands and show you how it works, okay? <laughs> Um, but you'll see the gist of it. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, watching workflows work is not exactly the most, you know, oh my God, that's incredible. It's more like modeling it and seeing how to do it and how to build all this stuff, right? So I think that the actual execution of the workflow is not as important, but we'll, you'll be fine with it. I also want to show you how to build association and initiation forms, stuff that has not been easy in the past that I think is really not all that bad. Um, same thing, how, if I have a workflow that is currently in flight, meaning I've initiated it, it's running, 
It may be asleep. It may be in the middle of an episode, but it has not fully terminated. I'd like to take that workflow and broadcast a message to it from the client. How do I do that? It's really simple. And then to do that, both with the initiation and association forms and custom events, you've got to use the client object model. Specifically, you're going to want to probably use, you have to use the JavaScript part of it, or what people refer to as the JSON, the JavaScript object model, the JavaScript client object model. Um, the last session, uh, Chris O'Brien was up here talking about SharePoint hosted apps. I'm, you know, get to do the same uh, thing talking about uh, kind of a scenario that we that we did um, in my session tomorrow about SharePoint hosted apps. And he said some stuff that I that kind of hit close to home about JavaScript development and how learning JavaScript development. Um, I, I love to ask this question in the new world of SharePoint, where we're really being kicked off the box and we got to work with in other technologies, either in Azure or in some other cloud, or we work in the client, we got to know JavaScript. It's a big core piece of this. So I want to ask everybody two questions, and I'll almost put money on it that I bet you're going to have the same response that everyone else has. Right? So first question, how many of you consider yourselves really strong JavaScript developers? You can be honest. OK. How many of you consider yourself JavaScript developers, that you can do it? OK, my guess is, is that, and, okay, no, uh, third question. How many of you, pretty much the, the people who raised their hand second, how many of you fall into the camp that I'm in, which I'm a JavaScript developer, I've been doing it for 10 years, but now that I see all the stuff that's going on in the last year, I've really just been hacking my way through it and copying snippets off different websites and making them work on mine. <laughs> right, OK, that's all we've been doing. And now all of a sudden we're starting to see patterns and stuff, and all of a sudden it's in vogue, right? So now, I'm curious. What are you interested in, right? Are you interested in seeing some code in a lot of slides, knowing that we're in the dev track? Or are you interested in a little bit of slides and lots of code? Yeah. Lots of, OK. That's good, because as I'll show you, I didn't have a choice on the choose your own direction. <laughs> we don't have many slides. We're almost done, <laughs> OK? Actually, between both of my sessions, the one today and the one tomorrow, I consider like the ones I just did, the agenda stuff and all that, that's not real slides. These things, like the content slides, I think I have a total of seven slides. So I'm like Mr. Demo over the next two days. But I'm in the, we're in the dev track, so that's good, right? Except we're in a smaller room, and I was like, God, please don't tell me you put me in the information worker track, and I have no slides. <laughs> it's all demos. They don't, they're scared to see stuff. OK, so what's different about workflow in SharePoint 2013? First, what we had in SharePoint 2010 was that the SharePoint engine was the host for the workflow uh, foundation runtime. And it hosted the runtime, which is the thing that was responsible for executing instances and storing the workflow definitions and all of that kind of stuff. It's something we could do outside of SharePoint with classic just .NET framework. And we could host the runtime inside of like a console application. We would have to provide all of the different services it needed, like the persistence and storage and scheduling service and the data stores and all that around it. But SharePoint has done that for us in the past. SharePoint has supported the .NET Framework 3.5 Service Pack 1 of the workflow engine in SharePoint 2010. That is still true today in SharePoint 2013. SharePoint 2013 still hosts the .NET Framework 3.5 Service Pack 1 uh, workflow foundation runtime. It is still there. So everything you did in the previous version is going to still work in 2013. You just don't get to play with any of the cool stuff I'm about to show you. But just know that that's, even though I'm talking about this new stuff, it's not going to pour it over. So the, the question is, well, then how do I move over from this new version? Where's the upgrade button? I'm like, well, that's the upgrade button is, is clicking the pay my consultant button. He's going to have to go through and he's going to have to uh, rebuild everything over to the new engine. But the other option that you do have is that the new engine, I'm going to explain in just a second, can ha has a specific activity that will allow you to invoke a old school workflow. It's not the name of the workflow, the activity, but it's something like that. Invoke the old one. And so the old engine calls into SharePoint and say, go, says, go run this old workflow and notify me when you're done. And then it comes back to your new school workflow. Again, that's not a technical term. And then it'll continue up where it left off. OK, so we're good looking back. What did they do? Well, the workflow team worked with the Azure team. And it built a product called Workflow Manager 1.0. Workflow Manager 1.0 is free. 
And what it is, is it is a host for the Workflow Foundation runtime. And it's a host for the .NET 4.5 workflow runtime, right? So you'll see a lot of stuff on MSDN and TechNet that say we host the .NET 4 workflow runtime. Take a look at the date of those articles. They're all from July of last year when they did the, art, the ship of, uh, sh of, the, of workflow. And the SharePoint team hasn't gotten around to updating those docs just yet. But that's also a really cool thing that they haven't gotten around to it because what that says is that SharePoint is not dependent on the version of Workflow anymore. SharePoint is dependent upon Workflow Manager being in existence. Workflow Manager can support the latest and greatest stuff independent of SharePoint. So what SharePoint now does is when you tell it to go, when you publish a workflow to SharePoint, what SharePoint does is he actually stores a copy of it, what we call the truth, it's the, main, the, the master copy of that workflow, and then it sends a copy over to the product called Workflow Manager. Workflow Manager then maintains this copy, and whenever I set up an association on a SharePoint list to that definition, what SharePoint does is he tells Workflow Manager to say, I want to go, I want this list, or this thing that we call a scope, I want this thing to be scoped, this definition to be scoped to this ID, to this definition. Under the covers, Workflow Manager is using a, lo a copy of Service Bus to maintain subscriptions so that when someone wants to be notified of something, SharePoint only sends one message over to Workflow, and then Workflow stores it inside Service Bus, which then does the pub-sub model to notify everybody on the back end. So if I have one workflow being used a thousand times in SharePoint, SharePoint in, in a thousand people are going to, a thousand workflows are supposed to kick off when that one item gets updated. Only one message is sent from SharePoint over to workflow. Workflow is the one that spiders off and creates a thousand instances. Okay? Um, the way this is all set up is that Microsoft has already installed Service Bus and Workflow Manager and configured everything in the cloud. Locally, if you're doing things on prem, like I'm doing them, then you have to go get a copy of Service Bus and Workflow Manager and install them locally in your farm. They don't have to be on the same SharePoint box. They can be. Which is the right thing to do? I don't know. That's what the IT Pro Track is for. I'm just a dev. I have to give them a job somehow. Right? 365 is going to try and take enough of their stuff away. We have to break things still, too. If we don't break them, they can't fix stuff for us. So, um, It's tongue-in-cheek. I like playing the devs and the IT pros against each other because it just works. So that's the gist of it. Now we have a lot of, let me come back, I'll come back to the kind of install and setup stuff. What are the big changes that we have though, aside from the architecture, which I, that was really just kind of scratching the surface of how everything works under the covers. If you're interested, come find me the next two, three days. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. There's a lot more stuff coming. I'm doing a lot, there's one of the downsides to workflow today is that there's not a lot of information on MSDN or TechNet about it, on how to do this in SharePoint. That's being fixed. There's a bunch of samples that are getting published. I've got a, a four or five more that are getting published this week uh, for the workflow team. And a bunch of, I'm working on a bunch of articles for MSDN about the gaps that they have, which should be out in the next few months. Okay, so there is stuff coming. They know that they're deficient there, and they've, they're acting on it. Um, so what are the big changes that we've had, though, in term, from the developer side or the capability side that we can do? Well, one of the biggest changes that they've made is that now workflows in SharePoint are 100% declarative. That means that, like in SharePoint 2010, I had SharePoint Designer, which would build declarative workflows, and Visual Studio, which would build programmatic or coded workflows. That's not true anymore. Visual Studio cannot build a coded workflow for SharePoint 2013. You can't do it. It's not possible. Right? You, you technically can still do it, but when you do it, you're doing it as a 2010 workflow and deploying it as a farm solution, and it's not using all the new sexy stuff that I'm going to show you. Okay, so you're still working old school. So you look at it and say, well, wait a minute. I had some custom logic I needed to implement here. How am I going to get around this? Well, the way you're going to get around it is Microsoft says, your workflow has to call web services, and we've given you a new activity to do this. And not only that, if your web service can respond with a JSON response instead of XML, as most OData services, ha well, as OData services should and have to, according to the specs, we are also giving you a new data type called dynamic value, which knows how to work with these hierarchical structures to pull data back out of the response or put it back in. And it's not too hard to work with this stuff. If you haven't done this since R, if you haven't done this since the RTM of the DevTools shipped about a month ago, 
it is so much easier. That I've never, I haven't seen so many changes from a beta to an RTM in terms of new features and functionality and cleaning stuff up. And then from the changes they made from RTM of workflow up to the updates they had in February for the cumulative update of the things they fixed and improvements they made, as well as the stuff that changed in the March update for SharePoint 2013 around workflow, it's radically different. If you're doing SharePoint 2013 and you're not on the March update you, and you're doing workflow, you're missing out on a whole heck of a lot. In fact, the RTM of the dev tools will not work on around workflow unless you're running the March of the 2013 uh, product update and workflow manager updates and stuff. All right, we'll come back to that in a bit. Another nice thing about this that's new is that we have full parity across all the different hosting options in SharePoint 2013. Are you on-prem? Are you in the cloud? Are you hybrid? I'm building a workflow for you, and I don't really care because it's going to work the exact same way. Workflow Manager was built to run in the cloud and on-prem from the start, from the time they started building this. SharePoint doesn't care where it is. You're going to have a Workflow Manager farm, and you're going to have a SharePoint farm, and you simply have to make them aware of each other on how they can use each other. All right? If you're on-prem, you don't use the cloud one. You use hosted. You use all local. If you're in the cloud, you use all hosted. All right? Forms are so much easier to build. How many of you built forms in previous, in previous versions of SharePoint workflows? How many of you tried? Let's do that first. How many of you tried to do forms? Yeah. How many of you succeeded? How many of you loved doing it with InfoPath? <laughs> right? One person. Okay. We found the one. <laughs> Another thing that's new, that's so much easier now, so it's a lot easier and all the stuff's going to be done using the JavaScript client object model. So life's going to be a lot better there. In addition, another thing we have, we're going to be able to leverage workflows inside of SharePoint apps and we're going to be able to have this whole workflow services client object model that I'm going to show you um, some stuff about today and I'm actually going to go into it a little bit tomorrow as well. So how do I get off, the, get up and, uh, get off the ground, get running? What you need to do is go install Service Bus and Workflow Manager um, locally on your, on your developer machine. All right, you're going to want to do this local. There's one difference between workflow local versus workflow in the cloud, and it's around the debugging experience. It's this little client that pops up that you don't get if you're in the server because Microsoft isn't going to let you log into the server and see a client pop up in 365. It's kind of obvious. What you're going to want to do is go install it. You then want to ensure that you are logged in as when you go to configure it, because it's just like SharePoint. You install the product with no options. It says puts everything up there. Step two is run through the configuration wizard, just like SharePoint. So I run through the configuration wizard, and this is important. When you do this with Workflow, you want to be logged in as the user that's going to be running as the service account for Workflow. If you don't, you'll frequently see, not all the time, but you will frequently see this weird timeout that will happen. In the, uh, it, you see other errors, but you, if you go all the way down through the logs, you'll see they're all coming from a timeout problem. You want to make sure the easy way around this is make sure you're simply just logged in as the user that has the rights to, to run Workflow. That's going to be run as a service account. Okay? After installing Workflow Manager, you then have to establish a connection between your SharePoint farm and your Workflow Manager farm. The way you do this is you tell SharePoint that is the endpoint of your Workflow farm. So you see here inside this, you're going to do this through PowerShell. So you see here where it says workflow host URI is one of my parameters I'm passing in. That is the URL of where I have my workflow engine um, installed. It's at workflow.swampland.local. All right. The other thing you have to do is you have to tell workflow where the endpoint is to SharePoint. How do I get back in? Well, the way that SharePoint works for his endpoints to work is that SharePoint has to, have, has to be running inside of a web application. And what constitutes running in a web application is that you have a, a web application that's been created or a website in IIS, and that web application has to have a single site collection living at the root of that web app. Right? It doesn't have to be templatized. You don't have to be using it for anything. But you have to have something there. And then once there is a site collection there, then SharePoint will listen on that, on that web app. If you don't, it isn't going to work. What trips people up, I get this question more than anything right now with SharePoint 2013, is that on mine, you see I'm pointing to a site collection called internet.swampland.local. The number one question you get back is, do I have to do this for every web application? Or do I have to do this for every site collection in my farm? No, you don't. You just do it one time per farm. right? 
What happens if I delete internet.swampland.local? What do you think is going to happen? You're going to have to do it again, okay? <laughs> it's got to get there. If you kill it, then of course you're going to have to do it. What if I uninstall SQL? Is SharePoint going to work? <laughs> Did you come from that room? No. <laughs> right? I love those. You get some questions going, no, no, common question. What if I do this? Like, really? Did you? I'd like to replay this back to you so you can hear what you just asked me. Because we both should experience the humor, because that was really funny. Um, another thing that you can do here is you can specify a scope. What's that? Anybody have more than one SharePoint farm in their environment? Right? Oh, man, you mean I got to sit there and have a single workflow farm for each SharePoint farm? No, I don't. What you can do is you can have a single workflow farm that actually serves up workflows for multiple SharePoint farms. And the way you do that is you scope them. So you're effectively creating like a tenant inside of the workflow manager farm by passing a scope in. I think it's way too early for people to say, this is a best practice yet. Because I mean, SharePoint's been in the wild for just a few months and then they did all these changes in March that I'm sure that you know, we're still waiting for the first people to come back and say the March PU broke my environment. But um, I'm sure that there's, it's too early for best practice, but if there was a best practice, I would say you, you might as well scope it from the get go because it at least enables you to, do, to use it for other environments if you want to down the road, okay? There's no harm, there's no foul in doing this. The last thing is, hey, I'm running in developer mode. What does that mean? That means I'm logged in as administrator, that means I sign in, I have any security dialogue that pops up that says, are you sure you want to? You just click yes, You're like, what did that say? I have no idea, All right? I went through PowerShell's in bypass mode, and I don't run SSL in this case here. So in my developer environment, I'm not running SSL, but the way workflow is getting back into SharePoint is he's using the whole S2S model, the high trusted um, apps. And so what he's doing is he's passing off an OAuth token from workflow over to SharePoint to get in. And when he does that, that OAuth token, it's through the whole certificate thing, the two-legged OAuth tokens. OAuth, SharePoint only by default is gonna support OAuth over SSL. And I'm telling it, eh, don't do it for this. We're okay to do HTTP. So, do you want to do this in production? Absolutely not. In fact, they say it's a requirement to run it with SSL, right, and with workflow. But that's your developer environment. So I'm up to speed. I've got RTM and everything on. I'm good to go. Now what? Now you need to go, you want to get updated, all right? Now there's three things you want to do, and they're little gotchas kind of things. The first one, you want to go update Service Bus and Workflow Manager. There are product or uh, cumulative updates that shipped in February of this year, of 2013. You want to install both of those to your environment, right? The workflow one is a little flaky. Like you go to install it and then the installer kind of goes away and you're kind of looking at a blank desktop like, I guess it worked, right? And so you start looking around and stuff like, I, I wonder if it worked. And you go into the add remove programs and you still service bus and then service bus February update and then workflow manager and nothing and you're like, Hmm. You go look at a couple blog posts and you see that some people have said, go look for this file to see if it's this version. And you're like, all right, it's looking. Mine's not like that. And then within five minutes, you see this little dialog box pop up and say, workflow installed successfully. I'm like, oh, I appreciate you getting out of my way while I'm doing other things while you're installing. But let me know that you're still working and you didn't just go away. At least SharePoint's telling me it's working on it all the time. But I mean, give me something. <laughs> So you want to do that. That's one little gotcha I had. I, did, I, I installed Workflow Manager, I think, 30 times before, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, 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 you just do it once. If you do it more than once, you're screwing things up. I'm like, oh, really? I'm like, did you do it more than once? Mm -hmm. How many times? I'll go back. The other thing is you want to update SharePoint. Now, there's a very big change that happened inside SharePoint 2013 product update. And I haven't, it's referred to in one of the TechNet articles. They don't explain what it is. This is a big, big change. And the dev tools not only give us a lot of new functionality around workflow, but the dev tools change the way workflows are packaged and they're dependent upon the product update from the March 2013 uh, uh, product update that came for SharePoint. There are these things called deployment groups inside of SharePoint when you go to deploy stuff. There's a deployment group for WSPs. There's a deployment group for apps. Well, there's a new one, a deployment group for workflow. And if you did any workflow development before the RTM of the dev tools, you might have noticed you had element manifest file in next to your workflow, just like we did in 2010. But if you look at the RTM, the element manifest file is gone. That's because workflows are not packaged up with the WSP when they do the deployment. If you try to build a workflow in an app and you deploy it, 
when it goes to SharePoint, SharePoint's going to give you this weird error about an app, a, a workflow app part not registered. And essentially what it's saying is, hey, your app manifest has got this thing in it. We have no idea what that is. Installing the product update added that as a capability. Okay, so you need all of this stuff. I'm tired of using slides. So we will now transition over to demo. Anybody, everybody cool with getting your environment up to speed? Any questions about that stuff? No. Okay. All right, so we're done with slides. Go away. And let's just see if internet's working because I have, we want to call web services. And we can't bing that for me, so we're going to have to do jazz hands. All right, so here's what I've got. I've got a SharePoint environment here. Um, I got a SharePoint environment. Well, I hope I have a SharePoint environment here. Don't tell me you went to sleep. Forget these red messages. That's what they do. They fix that stuff. So here we go. We got, I got my SharePoint environment. Got my little developer site. And what I want to do is I want to build. Uh, oh, I want to build some workflows. So let's do some do some simple stuff in the designer here. So I'm going to come over here and say file brand new project. And I'm going to pick Office and SharePoint, and I'll pick apps, and then don't do what I always do, which is just go straight down here and start working. Make sure you change it to app for SharePoint, otherwise you get pictures of Excel and Word, and you're like, oh, what the heck is that client stuff? So I'll come over here, and I'll go to dev slash SP Evo, and I'll zoom the screen in when I, when I, uh, uh, when I get to some of the uh, stuff that might be a little bit hard to see. The, this stuff isn't all that important. And I'm going to make this a SharePoint hosted app, and I'll just leave it called SharePoint App 1 and I'm pointing it to my developer site. So what we're, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you a couple little things, and I'm, I'm kinda hoping I get one little issue that pops up with the RTM of the tools so that I can show you how to get around it. Um, if not, I'll just talk to it. Um, so there, there's, there's your first thing if your demo breaks. I just told you I want it to break so I can show you something. So I just went on record for that, okay? So let's go build a workflow. So I'll just pick a workflow. So here's my two 2013 style workflows, uh, workflow things I can use up here. I can do either a workflow or I can do a custom activity. Now, I've got a sample in here that shows a custom activity. Let me just talk about them just for a second. You can build a custom activity using Visual Studio to use in other workflows. And so the first one that I'll show you is doing everything in a workflow. The second one I'll show you, I've actually refactored part of that out into a custom activity. The custom activities are declarative only. They're not coded custom activities. They can't be coded. So you can use them inside of your apps, and everything's just fine. However, if you want to be able to use this activity outside of that specific app web where your app is being installed, you can't use an app. You have to install it as a farm or a sandbox solution. Then you could use custom code if you wanted. But that way is how you're going to get an activity registered in the host web or in the site collection for use in other places. So there's a part that is kind of buried in there, but it's actually one place that was SharePoint 2013 where they're like, if you want to do a custom activity that works outside of an app web, you have to do it as a solution. It's like, so you don't use apps. So I'll pick workflow, just leave it called workflow one. We'll make it a, actually, uh, we'll make it a, let's, let's go add a list real quick to make sure that we can, that this will, this will work. Um, I can use a list workflow. So I'm going to create a list. It's called list one. It's based off announcements. This is the worst dialogue in the world. You guys seen this? In 2013, I love this. Do you want to create a customizable list template and a list instance of it, or create a list instance based on an existing list template? It's like, what? <laughs> and it's like, oh, that one's got lots of options. That one has a few options. I'm going to go with the lots of options one. No, that's not the one you want. This one really just creates an instance of it that you can't, you can't mess with. The other one creates a definition and an instance. They basically just took two or three templates we had in SharePoint 2010 dev tools, and they merged them into one to make it more intuitive. <laughs> I love this product. I really do. I just swear, I think they put softballs over the plate for us to swing at every once in a while because this is a pretty dry topic. So I'll come over here, and let's go back and add our workflow. Or that list is, is fine enough. So I'll create my workflow, workflow one. It's a list workflow. I'm calling it workflow one. And then I'm getting all the classic options here to say, do you want me to create the association list for you? I can also create the task list for you as well. This is a list workflow. Which one do you want me to associate it with? You just answer some questions and everything is nice and happy. 
right? Do you have to do that? No, you can say I'll do the association myself. I'll say next, it asks you the classic, do you want to do it manually? Do you want to do it automatically? I'm not going to run this workflow, so I'm just going to go ahead and say finish because I'm going to show you some of the web service stuff and everything in a second before I, I show you some of my pre-canned demos. And then you wait for this little false sense of progress bar down here, and you now have our workflow design surface. So let's go on a little tour here for the workflow design surface. All right? What just happened? All right, so first, let's come over here and look at our Solution Explorer. What you're going to see here in the Solution Explorer is that I have a workflow one, and that's where my workflow is going to live. This is the part where I said it's different in the, de in the RTM of the tools from the pre-RTM tools because you actually have an element manifest file in there. If you're doing it with a solution, you, d you, you still don't have that element manifest file, or you get the element manifest file, and it knows how to deploy those things. All right? That's what you need the product update for. It also went in and created an instance of the history list and the task list, so I'm good there. Um, the properties window is just the classic properties window. As you select things all throughout the, uh, the design surface or in um, the Solution Explorer, you'll see all of these different options. For instance, details about the associations it'll automatically create and details about the definition of the workflow itself that you can go modify. What's his name? What's his description? Stuff like that. Okay. Now, the other thing that we're going to get, we obviously get right here this little uh, place where we can do all of our workflow development. I'll come back to that because we'll spend a bunch of time there. And then down here, you're going to see this extra little area. And I, I clicked on variables to get this to pop up. What you're going to end up doing is you're going to define all your variables inside your workflow. You're going to define them in this little interface here. And just think like under the covers, you're creating fields inside of like a C-sharp class or a VB class if you're still doing VB, right? And you haven't taken your C-sharp pills yet. So the variables, you're going to define the, the, the type of variable it is, a string, an integer, any of that kind of stuff. And then you also tell it what the scope is. And the scoping is where you're going to be able to group variables inside of sequences or to a set of activities. So if I'm doing, a, if my workflow does a ton of stuff, as you'll see a couple of them to show you, but I'm doing like one section here to go get some information about the user, that means I have to go call a web service. I need to go part, get the results of the web service and parse the results to get the actual name out for the person. Well. The URL for the web service I'm going to call, the response that I got back, and the parsing of stuff, I don't need all of that in my entire workflow, and it's going to dirty up this little view here. So instead, I might only have the username as the one scoped at the full workflow, and then the rest of them are scoped a little bit more narrowly. So generally what I do here is I'll come in and I'm going to rename this sequence here, and I just call mine root as the shell of my workflow. And then as I add other activities in, like let's say I added in another sequence, inside of this guy from the design surface. And let's say that he did something like looked up a user, right? We have more work to do. It's nice. They used to give us those warning messages and the errors. Instead, they just give us blue icons. So it's not as bad. But if I try to build it, it's still going to break. So they just blue is just a little bit more. It's just the new SharePoint look, right? So in here, inside this sequence, I can create a variable here for, like, say, the result, so um, the user properties. And what I would do here to change the variable type, can you guys see this okay? You good? Okay. I'll come down here and change the variable type to browse for more types, and I'm gonna, I know that what this activity does is it's going to call the web service for, to get data back for a user. Because remember, the workflow is running on a separate farm. It's running in, inside a workflow farm. Workflow farm is going to call over to SharePoint using REST, and it's going to get back a JSON object back. So I'm going to go use this activity we have in the Microsoft.activities um, namespace called dynamic value to go get the result back. And I, don't want that, I want that scoped at this sequence here, but let's say I want the user name, and I'm going to have that scoped to the root so that when I'm up here inside the root, you'll see that user properties goes away. But if I'm inside the sequence, properties comes back. All right, so that's kind of nice. A couple other things I wanted to show you, too, just uh, real briefly about before we get into some of the more details. Um, there's three activities that I, that I find very useful. One of them you're very familiar with. right? It's the write to the history list. It's now just called 
right to history, which is great because it used to be called log to the history list, I think. So I spent forever looking for this, couldn't find it, finally just typed in history, and oh, there it is. So you write to the history list, and this is where you can go through and write little log messages, a status, status message, and you just come over here to add your message, come over here to this guy, and you can either type it in there, or you're going to write like a C-sharp expression to say like, you know, the current time is date time dot now dot to string, something like that. And you ignore this with an issue that I had in Visual Studio. So that was, that was an Andrew bug. That was, I can't blame that one on them. All right? So that's a, valid, that's a valid right to history. Another thing that's pretty cool is that we have this thing called the, this little um, debugging client. So when you're doing stuff on-prem and you go to debug your workflow, you've got this option On your workflow, if I right click on this on your workflow and go to the, the properties of the project, come on, and you go to the SharePoint tab and scroll down, you'll see that you've got this enable workflow debugging not supported in SharePoint Online because what that does is it's going to launch a little console application that is attached and listening to your workflow and these right lines broadcast a message to Service Bus. Service Bus broadcasts those messages to anybody that's subscribing to, those, to things coming on that topic and that stuff that's coming, and that's the console app is what's listening to those messages. So that's cool little debug information. I know you guys probably did the same thing I did. The history list was used for so much debug stuff. I honestly have not, in all the workflow stuff I've been doing over the last few months, I haven't set any breakpoints on activities going through anymore. I just use write lines and see what stuff is going on and to write out the variable names. It's a lot like the developer tools that we have in the different browsers. Right? I like it a lot more. Um, sometimes you're going to run into an issue where it says, hey, I can't start the dev, I can't, stop, I can't start these debugging tools, something's broken. And what you do is you just need to, you can start it yourself. So if you go under program files x86, workflow manager tools 1.0, you'll find something called the test service host, and you want to run him as an admin, and it opens up this console app, and it breaks with an exception that I've never seen before, right? That was wonderful. Oh, no, it's, you know what, let me do something. We're going to fully give up on the internet. I, well, in here right now. I'm, I'm still bought into this whole thing. I'm not going back to the fax machine. No, this is, I think that this one's going to be around. Either that or Zuckerberg had just a get rich screen. Okay. So we'll say that we have no internet now, and let's see if this will do it. Um, oh, lovely. All right, we'll try some stuff. No, it's not running yet. We would see it down here. OK, that's OK. That's not, that's not going to kill us. Um, the other thing that we can do, too, is that we're going to want to be able to get properties of these, of these things, like this is ultimately a web service call, okay? This lookup SP user, and this is new inside the RTM tools. Um, it's giving me an error here because it's telling me that I don't know where it's gonna stick the result. Well, I already know that I've got this thing called user properties that's of type dynamic value. So what I can do is change his result to go into the user properties here. He'll be okay with this now, but if I click on this guy under pro get properties, it adds in a new activity called get dynamic value properties, plural. So that what I can do, I have username here, I can click on define, say we're looking at a user type object, but if I was looking at that announcements list that I created, I could say no, no, go to announcements list or go to list one. I pick user and then it already pre-fills all the properties that are coming from that, like login name, which is like the claims based ID. And I say I want to assign that to the username field. And I save my changes and you'll see now that this guy, he, he actually does like that. He doesn't know that he likes it, but he likes that. Oh, SP is right, sorry. He needs to know the ID number. So I, you say we want user number two, right? You wouldn't just put two in there, right? You would. You'll see what we do in just a minute, but we can do that. Oh, look, there's the internet. Do you want to, no. No, that just, no. I disconnected the internet and said, hey, I found the internet. Oh, maybe we need those guys next door. All right. Another thing that's nice about the Workflow Engine 2, before I start showing you some the more robust demos I've got, is 
right click on these guys, I can set annotations. You can type some stuff. Looks like it doesn't really help you much except for that little note, but if you can pen this, you get a nice little comment showing up, all right? Okay, so let me show you some of the some, uh, workflows that I've got built here and kind of walk you through some of the scenarios. And of course, most of mine are using web services, so that's gonna give me a bit of a problem, but I'll show you, I'll at least show you the, the really, the cool one. I'll show you him working in a video uh, if, if it doesn't like it. Should work. Okay. So what this one is, is this one's going through and getting information about a customer, all right? So what I have is a, cust a web service running on the machine that is an OData service, I got it from CodePlex, that is um, surfacing the AdventureWorks 2012 data uh, coming from the AdventureWorks 2012 database that I have installed locally. So I've got my two uh, lists over here, and I have also am going to have, uh, I have my workflow that I've created. I also have created a, another list here called customers, and all the customers list is is a custom list with a couple fields for a person's um, ID or a product. I think it's a cus complete customer details, or I think it's customer DTA, yeah, customer person, where I put a customer ID in, and that's all I put into the list, and I save it, and it kicks off the workflow that goes and fet goes to the web service, pulls back the details for that one customer, and then updates the list item. So how do we do that? Well, what you see here is I've kind of broken this down. Oh, that's lovely. You know what? Let's go with this. Because you're gonna get into like this lovely eternal loop. Let's try that again. And just to be safe, we're going to kill you. Okay, so um, I have these different, you can see I have these different, uh, different sections here. So I have an init section that's gonna collect the customer ID, enter by the user item, customer data uh, from, go get the data from the, the web service, and then I'm gonna process the response, and then at the end, I'm gonna go update the list item. So let's look at these different pieces here. So for the initialization, I like to do these things like, Set, the right, uh, set a right line here to say notify the user in the status page, the workflow just started, the, um, or workflow starting right line, that's to the black console window there that we saw that that wasn't all of a sudden working, which it was two hours ago, go figure. The history list is just gonna tell it that something has been updated, and then what's cool about this guy, this set user status, this is gonna set the status page to telling it what the status is of the workflow. So I have control over what shows up, not just the workflow is started, but I can tell, notify users of certain things, like now we're calling the web service, and now we're processing the results. Instead of writing all that stuff just to the log, maybe we're in like a stage, and we wanna say what stage we're in. So I, I like to use the set user status quite a bit. Now, this activity here, what this says is that get, get the, this, um, Get this to go, I added a lot of annotations here so that when you guys go download the code, you'll, you can really see what's going on in each one. But what this one's gonna do is this one's gonna call over to SharePoint to go get all of the details about the specific item that kicked off the workflow, but I really only wanna grab that one field, the ID of the field. So if I look at this, I dropped in get SP list item, and if you look at my properties over here, Here's some new stuff that we got in the RTM of the tools. Oh, let me open that up a little bit so it's easier to see all the values. In the past, the first thing we had to do with list-based workflows is we had to go grab the GUID of the list that kicked it off and the GUID of the, of the item that kicked it off. We don't do that anymore. They gave us those options, current item and current list. That is so much nicer than what we had pre-RTM, right? Um, the result, Custom item properties. That is a variable that I created over here under variables. Here's my customer, custom item properties, all right? If I scroll down a little bit farther, I've defined the properties that I want to get out to be e really? There, to be the customer ID. Pull the customer ID field out of the list and stick it into the local field here called customer ID. And you can even see that when you hover over it, that little tooltip there is saying it's actually called the title field on that list. So I renamed the title field, okay? So now that I've got the item, I've got the details about the item that I want, and then I'm just writing out, you know, which one I'm gonna go grab. 
Let's get out of init. This, get, people get lost with this too because you'll see that, hey, I'm, I'm still inside of my init step, but oh wait, where's all the rest of my workflow? Well, it's right there in the tiny little breadcrumbs. SharePoint lost their breadcrumbs, but Visual Studio got them. So come back over here and we'll look at, oh, we just went in there. Now we're gonna go look at getting the customer data from the web service. So you can, you can obviously open it up this way or just double click to get inside of it. So what am I doing? I'm building up a URL. Now, what I did when I built this up for this activity is, this is called the assign activity, and this is basically saying, I wanna go set the value of a variable inside of my workflow. So in this case, I just said, go set the variable called Northwind Service URI equal to this, this URL right here, which you can't see from that nice tooltip, all right? And all this is is a string concatenation of a web service that's showing, putting the customer ID in, and just getting back the data back as JSON, right? This web service doesn't have the whole accept headers and all that kind of stuff, all right? Now I'm gonna use the HTTP send activity, and what that's gonna do is that's gonna say, go issue an HTTP get on this URL and stick the results into this variable called Northwind service response to go get the value, put that JSON object inside of this dynamic value. And then I showed you a second ago how we parsed out the results from another use of the dynamic value. Finally, the last thing that I'm doing is, so that's the getting process of response. The last thing I'm doing is saying, update the customer item. You get these blue warning messages every once in a while and if you know that everything is good, you should just be able to right click it and say build and it goes to build everything and they all go away. And you're like, really? And I was like, I just the messenger. The last thing here is I want to update the list item. So I drag and update the list item activity. And when you double click on this guy, sometimes it'll open up the designer. But if not, what you can do here is you specify in the corner and the properties window, the item ID, the list ID, which are just the current item and list. You can change these. You got, you got choices to pick from all the other lists that are available in your project. It could have said, the specific customer's list, but it's this, I know it's the same thing as the current list. And then I say, what properties do I want to pull, do I want to set? And in here, I set the properties on the, uh, on the item. I'm create, this is creating a dynamic value for me. What it's doing is, is it's taking the, the path, is the path, the JSON field that it needs to go update the item. So the contact name is the name of the field that I would have seen if I had pulled the data back as JSON using the REST API. The customer name on the right side, the value, that's the actual variable, the local variable that I have that I store the customer name from that web service call processing the properties. So with this, I should be able to go through and just say, start this guy. We hope he starts off, and if he doesn't, okay, so this is good. So it's not doing the debug guy, which I was hoping it would. Nope, it didn't do the debug guy. So that's the one, what you do is you get this error, and this is what all of a sudden is wonderful, because if you get an error that doesn't look, the fix for it is nothing, it looks nothing like what the actual problem is. It says, there's a configuration error, it's an SP exception, and specifically an activity, oh, that's not wrong draw tool. How about this? You get this right here, this activity validation exception. The fix is to run the client tool, which you saw wasn't working. So we're gonna, hopefully that this is actually gonna do it, otherwise my workflow won't run. Ah, cool, it's running. Okay, that's the good sign. All that stuff, that's good, all right? So come over here, now I hit F5, and all of a sudden it's gonna work. And you're like, that really was a fix? I never would've figured that out. Like me either, some guy named Cliff on some blog on MSDN posted it and I tried it and it worked for me, so. That failed install, lovely. It, maybe it wasn't the fix, god dang it. Now what are you saying? Oh my gosh, same thing, it's, this always fixes it. Of course, it's the first time I haven't seen it fix it. Let's do this. Try this one more time and then I'll show, you the, I'll show you some of the other ones. It's frustrating, they all work. Uh 
upload it, install, install, install. This time I'm running Visual Studio as the administrator, which is the same account that's running the test process. Lovely. All right, so this is going to sound really ridiculous that I'm going to say this, and I apologize, but trust me. This thing works. It's my environment, and it's the Internet stuff that's going on. The, the error that you're seeing pop up is talking about trying to hit an HTTP endpoint. It's not being able to hit the workflow endpoint that's supposed to be publishing this stuff or the service, point, the service bus topic that's on my machine. It's because we were playing around with the Internet a whole lot up in the speaker room, trying to get everything up and running. It was screwed up, so I ran back to the hotel, and I think I've cached IPs from different places and stuff. Everything was running. It's, I can try it, but it didn't do it, or it didn't do it earlier. Oh, don't, no, don't attach. Just run it. This is the last try. I promise this time. You try it. Okay, and one since I didn't want it to work because then I was going to just start going crazy. Like, that wasn't supposed to fix it. Same thing. All right, I apologize. Trust me that this one works. The other sample I wanted to show you, I want to show you some of the cooler stuff too. The other, one of the other samples I wanted to show you here, if I open up this project, there's another project here. This one we were looking at was the, the workflow HTTP GET. The custom action one, well, all this did, all this one does, it's a little bit different. Just a sample, I'm not going to go through this one because it's the same thing we just looked at. But the difference is, is that I added a custom activity. Of course, the sneeze never comes. Um, I added a custom activity here that is doing a lot of the same work of going, going to the web service and pulling the stuff out of that web service and handing the results back. What you use are arguments instead of variables. So you have an input argument which would be the name, the ID of the customer, and then output arguments, and you treat them the same way you treat variables. Okay? All right. I have two other samples that I'd like to show you, and instead of fighting with the debugging, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the approach of just making sure that I can show you these samples instead of trying to get this stuff working. So, with this one, this one's got a couple things that I'd like to show you. So this one is um, simulating the, the idea that you have, a, um, you have a, a manuscript that's getting written. And so there's draft copies of, uh, that are being written by authors. Those authors are submitting those draft copies for review a re that should assign a task to a reviewer. That reviewer is going to have a choice. He's either going to accept it and pass it on to the editor, or he's going to decline it, which should, uh, which should um, take the task and assign it back to the author to say, do some more work. So I could get in this kind of a loop. Ultimately, though, it should go to the editor, who's either going to uh, publish it, which would copy it over to the manuscripts directory, uh, document library, or decline it and push it out. So let's take a look at this. I've got a few libraries that are, that are used here. So I've got a drafts library and a manuscripts library that you see over there on the, on the right. I also have a bunch of dependencies that I'm going to pick through in a second. But let me show you the, the actual workflow process itself. So I'm setting the status at the very beginning. Setting the status of my workflow at the very beginning to saying the workflow is starting. And then on the initialization piece, there's a few things I need to do, right? If I scroll down in here, I need to get the document author. So with the document author, I want to go look at the current list item and the property that I want to fetch is, that's not the right one, come down to this one, the property that I want to fetch out, where is it? It disappeared on me. Oh. It's going to be the author ID, the, the created by uh, ID, which is... There's modified by, I missed created by. Created by. So that's going to be an integer value that comes back. It's going to be a number that comes back from the user information list. You're going to take that value 
and you're going to need to assign uh, you're going to need to assign the value back to someone else, right? Or you need to assign the use that value to go create a task to assign it to a user. Well, the trick is is that when you do that, there's a bunch of these. Where oh, you know what it did? When I clicked on that, there it is. When I clicked on that property thing a few times, it added a couple of those activities on accident. So there's where I'm fetching out the document ID author. I'm sticking it inside my variable called document ID author. Once you grab that ID out, you're going to need though to, to go through and to resolve that to a login uh, name, a claims ID, because that's what you're going to need to use inside of creating a task on the assignment piece. So that's where I have a step here called the get doc reviewer and editor. And if I scroll down here, it's, writing, it's simply going to write these two values out. Now, how am I writing these values out of the reviewer? I've just got this variable here of the reviewer. How am I getting this login name? Well, one of the things that I create with this workflow is that when, a, when someone creates a document, I don't want them to specify who the reviewer and the author is on their own. I want to do that when I set up the workflow. So what I'm going to do is I created a custom form. I right-clicked on my workflow itself, and I said I want to add a new item. This new item is either association or initiation form. I picked an association form, right, because I want to do this when I set this guy up. If I look at the association form that gets created, it's an ASPX page, I then went in and I added in a reviewer and an editor field and a people editor control that they could use. If I scroll down, when I, when I start the workflow, I'm going to click on this button that's going to run this JavaScript uh, function called start workflow. And this is part of the workflow CSOM to kick a workflow off. What I'm first doing in this section here is I'm getting all of the, uh, I'm getting the ID, the login ID of the, um, some stuff about the, the actual workflow itself that's up on the query string. That's all stubbed out for me by uh, SharePoint. In fact, all of this except for one little piece is stubbed out by SharePoint. All I'm doing right here is I'm saying, go find those two, uh, the people controls, the people editor controls, go find both of those to go fetch out the login name of those two guys. Then it does some client object model stuff to go get it references to some things. And finally, it's all boiling down to start workflow on list item. Here's a subscription, which is a GUID. It's, I can get into that a little bit more when I show you another app that I'm doing, um, that we'll do tomorrow, actually. Um, but this is a subscription, which is the association itself of the workflow on this list. Here's the item in question, and then there are the parameters being passed in. You saw the parameters that's passing in was doc reviewer login name and, and uh, editor login name. If you look at my workflow, what I created was two arguments here that are indirection arguments that are being passed in by the workflow engine for me. So that's creating the association. These two things are going to be passed in. Every time the workflow starts, it's always going to be passing those in so I can go retrieve those values. The next thing that we did, let's scroll down a little bit. Let's see, we get back up to the root is that I'm going to go start this workflow task process. Let's get rid of these. Now, what this is, let me back this up a little bit. So I've got a few more minutes here, about five more minutes. I'm going to show you one, other, one or two other things. This is using what's called a flow chart workflow. So what I've done is I added a flow chart to the root a second ago, and I added in this thing called a flow decision. You can use a flow decision or a flow switch. A switch works just like a switch does in C Sharp or VB, where you give it different criteria and it chooses the path that it goes down. A flow decision is you're going to pick the decision activity and specify what you can do, which, one, which, which direction we can go in. All right. So what I had done up here above this is in the reviewer review, when I got to this part, I actually created a single task. And that single task, that single task is going to build up uh, a task and go assign that to the reviewer to go edit and review that document. Well, if I take a look at that task, that little designer, you see I'm passing in the reviewer login name. There's a little title here. You can customize the email that goes out to them. There's a lot more email fields over here that you can customize. You can set the options. You always want it to wait for completion if you want the workflow to stop at this point, where before we would say wait for this to complete, use those correlation tokens. We don't do that anymore. We just say wait for it to complete. The workflow stops at this point, and it will spit the outcome out as one of these options that I've defined down here. Okay. Um, 
the variable that the workflow will be stored in for the, the outcome will be stored in a variable that we create here called the workflow task outcome, which is just an integer. And of the different options that are available to you, it's they're in a zero index array. It's zero, one, two, or three. And so that's why I said a second ago, down here under this one, reviewer task outcome is equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, then that means that that was the first option, so I know that was approved, and I route it over to the editor. Otherwise, I go into my no branch and go back down to the author, which actually routes a task back up to the author. Okay? Now, I know I'm almost out of time, so let me just kind of give you a bit of a shotgun approach on some of this stuff. I spent too much time trying to get that host process working. One of the things you can do when you create these guys, uh, and I have a, a blog post on this that goes into a lot more detail from last week, so I kind of point you to that instead of spending too much time on it here. But what it does is we can create custom outcomes. By default, you can, you're going to use the task called workflow task SharePoint 2013 to create your tasks. But that one gives you two different outcomes, either approved or rejected. And in certain scenarios, those two options aren't going to give you what you're really looking for. So you want to change it to be something else. Like, for example, what I would like is for my editor to have an option here called approved for manuscript or rejected for, manu for manuscript, okay? That's option zero and option one. The way you do this is you create a custom site column. It's of type outcome choice, and you give it your choices. You then have to create a custom ta uh, content type, and your custom content type should inherit from the workflow task content type, and then you add in your column. The problem with this, though, is that out of the box, there's a bug in the workflow engine, and it will always render out approve and, rege and reject, in addition to your two buttons of approve and reject for the manifest, right? So you're like, great, I've now got four options when I really need two, and two of them do the exact same thing. So there is a workaround, and I walk through the steps on my blog, but the workaround is don't inherit from workflow task, just inherit from task. So you can see here that I've actually chopped out right where my cursor is. I've chopped out the part of the content type that inherits from workflow task. I just go around it, and I add in the only thing that workflow task was adding in that was important, which is this site column. OK? That's a good workaround. The only downside to doing that is that when you do it, when you look in your workflow and you saw the task that I created here, single task, and I go to outcome options, notice that my custom task isn't showing up. It's because the dev tools are filtering everything derived from workflow tasks, SharePoint 2013. So if you look at a blog post from late last week, like Thursday or Friday of, my week, I, of, of last week, I walk you through the process of getting that to work. The last thing I'm going to show you here and is the, my last sample, and I've gone kind of up to my time here, so let me just, I'm just going to show you one highlight from this last sample so that you know what you're looking at when you take this code away, is under the fleet management one, and I've got a video of this one running, so I'll show it to you in just a second after I show you this other piece. Um, what this one does is I have a, on my list, let's see, where is it? Content, not content, it's under oh, fleet list. What I've done is I've created a custom action for my list. This idea is that I've got a car, a, a, fleet, a fleet of vehicles, and the cars need to be taken out of service every three months for an oil change, automatically. But in addition, I want to have someone to manually say, oh, sorry, I wrecked the car. we got to take it out of service. So I want to have an ad hoc request. So I have a submit maintenance request option. And when you look at the, the workflow itself, this is a state machine work, work, workflow. I have a first state that I go through called a knit, And then I put the car in service. I have two ways that I can transition out of service, one being either with a scheduled service and what that one is triggered by is a 30 second uh, delay right here. Or it's triggered by, oh, got to go up farther. Or it's triggered by this guy, a service request that's waiting for a custom event called ad hoc maintenance. How do I publish that event? That's right over here in the maintenance request. And this ASPX page right here, if you scroll down, I'm doing a few things, but I'm going to the instant service called publish a custom event that is publishing an event on this instance of this type, and I'm writing out this reason right here. Okay? So 
This one's a pretty cool one. I'm, just, I'm gonna just run this video here while I'm, while I'm wrapping up so you guys can see what it does. Let's go to full screen and play it. And yeah, play. So there's the host process starting up, which um, see it worked faster. So what it's doing here is it's going and creating the association. So I'm associating saying, who's the person that's gonna do the work? This is the custom association form you see in this. I'm picking the person, and this is also doing something else kind of cool. Let me stop that for a sec. What it's doing is the workflow, the initiation step, it's actually going out to a website called edmunds.com, and it's passing off a vehicle identification number, and, that, ve and it's, that web service is gonna give me all the information about the car. So you wanna see what car I drive, you can see this in a second. Um, I was passing in that key because the admins web service requires you to have an API key that you plug into it that you pass along on the request. So there's the request that's coming back from admins. So what I want to do is go into my fleet management and add a brand new car, and I'm going to go find my VIN and drop it in there, and I'm not going to make any other changes to this and save it. Well, I'll just put some stuff about my car here. Once this, I save this, you'll see the workflow kick off. It's going to run out to the web service. It's going to go find, get details about the car and update it. And then it's going to sit there for a few seconds. You see there's the workflow starting. I'm writing out a bunch of debug information. And now it's assigning the task. So now if I go look, it got updated with all the information from Edmunds. I go to the workflow service, go started. I can see now that a task is going to show up in a second. The tasks take a second to show up because they're a bit deferred with the workflow manager. It's in, it's in service. Now, you see it just went to automatic out of service, and a task got assigned to the maintenance worker right here under vehicle maintenance at the top. Right? Yep, it's out of service. Yep, it's that vehicle. Yep, that's that one. Yep, schedule maintenance. Come back. Come back. 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 Thank you. There. That one. Yes. And I say I want to change it. So here, there's the default buttons, approved and rejected at the bottom. I say approved, it's going to put the car back in service. You see the workflow debug, it's going to take a second to tell you what's going on. And you refresh it, the car's back in service. Or I can go back to the actual list and do an ad hoc request. And this is tough, I've got to do it kind of quick because if I don't do it fast, then I lose my, uh, let's see, where is it? Ad hoc, I'm going to go add another car, I think, now. Ta-da, come on. It's still out of service. I put it back in service. And then I'm going to do the manual one, and then I'll, and I'll wrap it up to... Sorry, I went just a few minutes over here, guys. All right, so we'll save it, and I'll go to the custom action. It's going to go in and, and put the car in service. So now it's in service. It's updated the car. And we've got to do this before in, uh, in less than 30 seconds, but you'll see there's a new custom action at the bottom there called Submit Maintenance Request. And here I can say I got a flat tire, and I submit it. The car is now going to be seeing, you see in the debug, it's going to tell you that, oh, go away, that the car's been taken out of service for a flat tire. All right? Really flexible on how to do this stuff. When you get these samples, when you go to install them and run them, that first page, the home page of the app, tells you how to end up using it. Okay? So it shows you custom tasks, custom task outcomes, custom events, working with the JavaScript CSOM, for SharePoint uh, workflow services, and it shows you how to do association and instantiation forms. So sorry the demos didn't, uh, if workflow farm kind of failed on me and stuff, but I thank you guys for sticking around. I hope you got something out of this at least. <laughs>